Aloha. Talofa. Good morning, church. Welcome to our visitors. We have many visitors this morning. Thank you so much for choosing to be with us. It's always encouraging for our church to have visitors. You could be anywhere on the island enjoying yourself, but you are here with us enjoying fellowship with your family in Christ and to worship our Father in heaven. So I want to encourage you with those words. This morning, we continue with our training in evangelism. 2 Timothy 2.2, 2, the Bible says, and Paul speaking to Tim uh, Timothy, the same things that you have learned of me among many witnesses, commit to faithful men, who will be able to teach others also. Strong churches remain strong in the faith when there is strong teaching passed on to strong Christians who will turn around and, and continue the process. And so when it comes to the great commission that God has given to the church, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every nation, he who believes and is baptized will be saved. He who believes not will be condemned. Mark 16, 15, and 16. When it comes to the Great Commission, we need training. We need encouragement. We need strengthening from the Word of God. And so in the past couple of months, our congregation, our church family, has been learning how to use this method of Bible study. Now let me reiterate that this is just one method among many good methods that are available that you can use and learn from to share the gospel with Christ Jesus. But this is a method that I personally used. This is a method that was also introduced to our congregation through the house to house and heart to heart uh, school of evangelism when we had that seminar in May. And so we continue our study of this method called Back to the Bible. If I were to choose a name for a method that will help someone learn the truth, I would choose this name. What a great name. Back to the Bible. In a world with religious confusion, people need to go back to the Word of God. People need to go back to the unchanging truths, to the unchanging paths of old. Now, we might say it's old, but it's only 2,000 years old, the gospel of Jesus Christ has been preached and it has changed lives throughout years. And so in a world where man has ruined religion for a lot of people, we, the church, need to bring people back to the power of God to convert souls. And that is the word of God. In book one, after the study of lesson one, the person we study with will understand that they don't need any other book. They don't need to ask anyone else concerning the salvation of their soul. The most important thing in your life, the salvation of your soul. You don't need to rely on words of man for that. You have the word of God that will tell you the truth. And that's what book one is all about. At the end of study of book one, the person comes away with this understanding. I must listen to the word of God and the word of God alone. If the preacher is preaching, I best be sure that I check the word of God to ensure that he is preaching to me the word of God. In lesson two, the person learns about the church that God purchased with his, with his blood. Acts 20 and verse 28. Again, in a world of religious confusion, go down while he was, California's uh, Avenue in Wahiwa, and you'll find multiple churches that man has erected. Multiple churches, their history traced back to some one known figure in history. What about the one church that you can go back in history around AD 33? The one that you can read about in the Bible. The study book two will point the person to that church. The church that belongs to Christ. Matthew 16 and verse 18. Jesus said, upon this rock, I will build my church. The church that, that's the one body 
Ephesians 1, verse 22 and 23, that God has given to Jesus to be head over the body. Ephesians 4 and verse 4, the Bible says there is one body. Now, I know we know how to do math. One means one. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 13, Paul says, For by one spirit are we baptized into one body. Christ is the head of that body. In book two, the person comes away with understanding. There is a church mentioned in the Bible, the church that belongs to Christ. There's the organization of that church. You have Jesus as the head, shepherds, and then you have deacons, and then everyone else. All right. You don't have presidents, vice presidents. You don't have one man on earth ruling over all the different locations of the church. You don't have any other form of leadership that you see in, in some churches today. But if you go back to the Bible, you see Jesus is the head of the church. Colossians 1, 18, that you have shepherds. 1 Timothy 3, Titus chapter 1, you learn about the qualifications of the shepherds. And then you learn about deacons, 1 Timothy 3, beginning in verse 8 and onward. Then you also learn about the name of the church. What should we call ourselves? Paulites, Lemites. We should be called Christians. And that there are designations of the church in the Bible. Romans 16, 16. Greet one another with the holy kiss. The churches of Christ greet you. That's a designation of God's people. How about the church of God? That's a designation of God's people in the Bible. Last week, we were in book three, and I mentioned book three is where you start seeing some pointed questions. Pointed questions are designed to see if the person you're studying with is really committed to following Jesus. Questions like, do you want to obey Jesus? Now, who would want to say no to that? All right. So questions are, are, are there in the booklet to, for those purposes. Book three talks about sin and salvation. And when talking about sin, as I mentioned, it gets awkward. It's not comfortable to talk about sins. Even as a Christian, to talk about someone else's sin. As you do that, you're thinking about your own sins. It's, it's, it's uncomfortable. But as I mentioned, if there's someone who is comfortable in leading another soul, from sin to salvation in Christ Jesus, it should be us. It should be the Christian. And so in book one, we learn and answer the questions. What is sin? The Bible gives us a definition of sin. 1 John chapter 3 and verse 4. Whoever commits sin commits lawlessness. For sin is lawlessness. And sin is lawlessness. Sin is living a life without regard to law. God's law, right? God's law, because God created this world. If you can speak a universe into existence, if you can form man from the dust of the earth, then you have the right to create your laws, and you have the right to demand from your creation, and God reserves that right. And so sin is any violation of God's law. Here's the second question. What does sin do? Isaiah 59, verse 1 and 2. In principle, it illustrates to us what sin does. Isaiah said to God's people, a people of Israel who was worshiping God, but then also bowing the knee to Baal, worshiping the idols, sacrificing to idols. How did they do that? Worship God here and then turn around, worship the idols. And so God looked at his people with, with, with anger because they were in sin. Isaiah says to them, behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save. God can save. Nor his ear heavy that it cannot hear. God does hear. But here's the problem. But your iniquities have separated you from your God and your sins have caused him to hide his face from you. That he will not hear. What does sin do? It separates the, the soul from God. 
That's what sin does. All right. Next question. What is God's punishment for sin? What is God's punishment for sin? Romans 6, verse 23. For the wages of sin is death. The payment for sin is death. Not just dying physically, but eternal death. Eternal punishment. We see that in Revelation 21 and onward. Revelation 21 and verse 8. The Bible says, but the cowardly, the unbelieving, the abominable, murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake with burns, which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. And then here's the important question. Who has sinned? If sin is a violation of God's law, if sin separates us from God, if sin is punishable by eternal hell, who have sinned? The Bible says, for all have sinned, fall short of the glory of God. But then there's another question. What has God done? For our sins. Because all of us sin. And we deserve. Of, of we, are, we, we deserve hell. We deserve God's punishment. But then God. Rich in his mercy. Rich in love. Did something for us. The golden text of the Bible. As some would refer to. John 3 verse 16. For God so loved the world. Those who are dying in sin. That he gave his only begotten son. The one and only who can save from sin. That whoever believes in him. Anyone who desires to follow Jesus. Will not perish. The greatest tragedy in life. Is to die in one sin. Because that means that person will perish. But have everlasting life. The greatest promise God gave man. Salvation in Christ Jesus. What has God done for us? He sent his son to die. Book three starts with a discussion of sin. But then it transitioned to this topic. God's justice. God is fair. In all his ways, God will not send to hell someone who does not deserve to be there. God will not allow in heaven someone who does not belong there. God is just. And justice has a demand. And we'll notice that in this study. And the study of God's justice is necessary that it follows the discussion of sin. Because often people would accuse God. How can a loving God send people to hell? People would accuse God this way. I like someone else's respond to that. How can a person choose hell? Over a loving God. You see we have choices. That we make. And God allows us. To make those choices. But God has already set. The consequences. Of our spiritual choices. If I choose to disobey God. Justice. Will be happy. Because God is just. Justice demands, or justice means God will punish the wicked. It's not a mistake. Second Thessalonians 1, verse 7 through 8. Notice this, church. And to give you who are troubled, rest with us when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who do not know God and those who do not obey 
the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Do we see this? God honors our choices. He's given us free will. And if I choose to deny God, if I choose to, I'm not going to be baptized for the remission of my sins. If I choose to go that route, here's God's word for me. In flaming fire, taking vengeance. And then that know not God. Do you know God this morning? And on them that have not obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ, have you obeyed the gospel of Christ? If not, do it this morning. Justice or God's justice will also reward the righteous. He is a just God. He will bless those that, that will obey him. Notice with me, Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 6, the Hebrew writer says, but without faith, it is impossible to please God, for he that comes to God must believe that he is, that God is real, that God, is exi that God exists, that God is who he is according to his word. Must believe that he is, notice the second part there, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. God is fair, isn't he? If I will choose to obey him, I will be rewarded. And this is not prosperity gospel, church. They have robbed the idea of Christian reward and use it to rob people. You will be rewarded by God in heaven. No matter the type of trial you face on this life, you remain faithful to God. He will reward you. And in Revelation 2 and verse 10, Jesus to a church that was persecuted, Jesus said to them, do not fear any of those things which you are about to suffer. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison and you will have tribulation 10 days. But Jesus said, but be faithful unto them and I will give you the crown of life. And so church, in this study of justice the person that you're studying with begins to understand. Yes, God is loving. That's, that's what I always hear. And I say, amen, he is loving. God is merciful. Yeah, I, I hear that in radio talk. And, the, and I say, amen, God is merciful. But sometimes people forget that there's the other side. That God is also wrathful. God is also just. And he will honor the choices that we make in the same format, church, as, as we always done it. As we go through the, the material, I will read the text and you fill in the blank with me. Here's our first text, Revelation 15, verse 3. And they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are thy works. Lord God Almighty, just and true are thy ways, thou King of saints. Here's the first question. Is God just or righteous? Yes. If a judge refused to sentence convicted criminals, would he be just? Would, be, would he be righteous? Would he be doing the right thing? No. It's kind of sad when you, you look in history. There have been many cases where we've seen that. That the criminal walks away. And then you have families of the victims. Praying for justice. Begging for justice. Even though man may be slick in his ways. Even though man may try to pervert justice and say, well, we got away with that, didn't we? They have not gotten away from God's justice. They will still stand before God. So we know the answer to that. If God says in his word that he will punish sinners, and then on judgment day, he doesn't punish sinners, then he's gone against his word. A word that he has exalted above his name. God is just. 
Does righteousness demand that a judge sentence convicted criminals? Absolutely. Notice the next verse, Romans 2, verse 11. For there is no respecter of persons with God. Is there a respecter of persons with God? No. Simple Bible teaching, right? You read the word of God and you answer the question. What that word means, uh, for some of us may, may, may not be familiar with the idea of the framing of respecter of persons. The idea is favoritism, right? Uh, this verse refutes Calvinism. That God have chosen some to be born saved and some to be born lost. What a tragedy is that doctrine. But God honors our decision, right? He is fair to everyone. Right? He doesn't treat me any special way and treat you in, the, in a bad way. That's not God. Again, he honors his decisions. He honors our decisions. Will God, oh, sorry, I skipped a verse there. Back up here, Romans 2 and verse 6. Who will render to every man according to his deeds. Question, will God render to every man according to his works? Yes. We'll be judged by the things we do. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 10, Paul said the same thing. For we must all appear before the bema, before the judgment seat of Christ. And everyone will receive according to what he has done. We have to think about what we are doing. As God will judge us according to our deeds. Here's the next verse. Revelation 20, verse 12 through 15. The Bible says, And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. And the books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books, according to their works. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. The dead were judged according to their works. All right? Again, it's not what we say. It's what we do. Jesus said, many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord. Have I not prophesied in your name, done wonders in your name, cast out demons in your name? And Jesus said, away from me, I never knew you. In Matthew 7 and verse 21, the beginning of that discussion, Jesus said, it's not, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does is the things that we do. But he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. The next question, whoever was not found written in the book of life was what? Was cast into what? To the lake of fire. Do you believe God? Church, I'm asking you, do you believe God would do this? He would do this. Just as we believe God will save us from our sins when we are baptized into Christ and live faithful life, just as we believe that to be true, this is also true. That God will judge. 2 Peter 3, verse 9, the second passage here, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some man counts slackness, but is long suffering towards usward, not willing that anyone should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Here's a question. Is it God's will that you be lost eternity? For, for, for eternity? No. God wants the very best for all of us. He wants the best for you. He wants the best for me. He wants us to be saved. In this context, there were some men who were, say, who were saying, where is God? Where is his judgment on us? There's evil everywhere. There is no judgment coming. Peter responds, God is not slack concerning his promise of judgment. As some think that he's low in judgment. But the reason why God is long knows, the reason why God is slow to judgment is because he wants to give man a chance 
He wants us to learn and to, to turn from our sins and to change our lives. That's what he wants. He wants all men to come to repentance, to turn from sin, and turn to God. Notice the next verse here, Romans 5 and verse 8. But God commanded his love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Question, did Jesus die for sinners? Something wrong with my remote? Maybe it gave up. But who are sinners, church? All. Right? And so Jesus died for all. Doesn't matter who you are. Doesn't matter what you've done in your past. You look at the Apostle Paul. What he's done in his past. He's blasphemed God. He caused God, he, he caused some of God's people to blaspheme God. He's murdered some of God's people, yet God still saved Paul. Can a murder be saved? Yes. And we are only saved because of the act of love, God sending his son to die on the cross. Here's the next question, was the death of Jesus on the cross an act of God's love? Absolutely. There have been times in studies that I've had with people. People start crying in this point. Because as they read about sin and then they see God's justice and punishment for sin, and then they read about his love. Some people have pride around this point in the study, and rightly so, because who wouldn't? Vile as we. Yet God gave us a chance. Romans 5 and verse 9, the next passage, but much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. Can we be justified by the blood of Jesus? Amen. The blood that we remember this morning when we drank of the cup. The blood that, that, that Paul said in Ephesians 1 and verse 7. In him we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins through his blood. Hebrews 9, notice here, or Hebrews 5 and verse 9. And being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. He became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that, I hope you underline this word in your Bible, obey him. Is Jesus the author of eternal salvation to those who obey him? Yes. What does it mean to obey Jesus? Well, John 14, verse 15. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. So keeping the commandments of God is obedience to God. Here's the next question. Pointed question, notice that. Will you be saved if you do not obey Jesus? No. 100% of the time in studies that I've had, the person always answers no. Why, why did they answer no? They, they, they have a feeling all of a sudden and they realize that the answer is no, no. They just understood from the simple teaching of God's word that we're all sinners and sinners go to hell. And without God's help, we would not be saved. And to receive that help, we need to be obedient to God. And so if I'm not obedient to God, I won't receive God's help. Matthew 7 and verse 21, 23. I was a little ahead of myself earlier. But here it is. Not everyone who saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. But he who doeth the will of my Father, which is in heaven, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works. And then I will profess unto them, I never knew you. 
Depart from me, you that work iniquity. Well, Jesus saved all those who call upon his name. No. All right? And that, that's the, in the sense here, if you're calling upon the name of Jesus in the sense that you're just Lord, Lord, or you're just saying a sinner's prayer or doing some other unbiblical thing for salvation, then, then no, the answer is no. Were these believers lost? And that's one of the interesting things about this, this insight on Judgment Day. Notice the people that were speaking to Jesus. They were not your atheists out there who hold their fist against God. This is not your humanist or agnostic or, 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 or any other non-believer out there. These are people who thought they were following Jesus. These are sincere people that thought that they were part of his church, that they obeyed the gospel, that they were doing his will. Notice what some of them were saying. We did these things in your name, Lord. What's, what, you're turning away from us? Verse 21 is key. Not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, but he who does, again, the things that we do, God's justice will render to us what we deserve based on the things that we do, not the things we say or the things we say we will do, the things that we do. According to verse 21, what must one do to go to heaven? To the will of the Father. With many religions, some people, they take this idea of the will of the Father and, 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 and create great confusion and, and say things like, hey, this is God's will for you. I know this because I saw a vision last night. And let me tell you what God's will is for you. It's lying through their teeth. Don't let anyone come to you and say, this is the will of God. And they speak to you without the scriptures. If you want to know the will of the Father, it is written in the word of God. Right? And it's there for that very purpose. So that one can look at it and know beyond a shadow of a doubt what the will of God is. So that we don't have to wonder, well, what is the will of God? Should, should we do all these things out here and then whatnot? What is the will of God? Whenever that question is asked, church, please, when you're present, say this. What does the Bible say? Because the Bible in the New Testament, we have the will of God for all of us Christians. This morning, we reminded of God's justice, that God will render to us according to what we have done. And if God did not send Jesus and the world end today, all of us would be in trouble. But that is not the case. God did send Jesus. God is wrathful, but he was also merciful. He is merciful. And God's mercy is extended here this morning. Maybe you're someone who is here this morning, and you realize you're not a Christian according to the word of God. You have not heard the word. You have not been baptized. You, you have not obeyed the gospel. If that's you this morning, I plead with you. You have this opportunity. You can be saved right here this morning. Begin your relationship with God. Here's what, here's what you need to do. You need to hear the word. The Bible says faith comes by hearing, hearing the word of God. You must understand who God is. You must understand who Christ is and what he has done and believe that Christ came to this world. He died on a cross for our sinners. He was buried on the third day. He was resurrected from the dead. 
You need to believe that. You need to hear about that first, but you need to believe it. That's the second step. Believe Jesus is the son of God. John 8, verse 24, Jesus trying to convince some of the Jews who were standing before him. Some of them, they did not believe him to be the son of God. And he said to them, I tell you, no, ex uh, unless you believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. You need to believe Jesus is the son of God. You need to repent of all sins. Paul wrote in Acts 7, Paul spoke in Acts 17 and verse 30, that the time of ignorance, God winked at, but now commands man everywhere to repent, turn from sin and turn to God. Confess Jesus is the son of God. Romans 10, 10, for with the heart one believes unto righteousness, with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Have the courage this morning. Stand before the audience. I'll take your confession. Just say, I believe Jesus is the son of God. And when you make that great confession, you are baptized for the forgiveness of your sins, just as the scriptures teach. And then you be faithful to God. This is God's mercy extended to anyone here this morning that has not obeyed the gospel. If you need to respond to the Lord's invitation this morning, I invite you to come join me in the front. Let's talk about it as we stand and sing the song of encouragement.